Good afternoon. I'm Anna Bader. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Axel Weissmuller. It's a particular pleasure for us to see Dr. Weissmuller in person today, as Chris Isabel and I have been collaborating with him on a COVID-related project for the last several months. Dr. Weissmuller's CV and list of accomplishments is longer than the drive from Rochester, New York, <laughs> where he is a professor of radiology, biomedical, and electrical engineering, and is the director of the AI Radiology Laboratory. Dr. Weissmuller is a visionary in the field of AI and healthcare. His research focuses on the development and evaluation of novel machine learning, AI, and health informatics technologies that expedite patient care, improve provider efficiency, advance clinical understanding, and streamline healthcare and healthcare management, with an overall goal to improve patient health and well being. With over 25 years of leadership, Funding and publication track record, he is one of very few people that can both be an accomplished clinical radiologist and an internationally renowned scientist, bridging the gap between fundamental research and clinical applications of AI and radiology. Dr. Weissmuller holds multiple national and international patents for his inventions of novel machine learning methods. His innovative work includes systems for automatic analysis of chest radiographs, imaging biomarkers for breast cancer and brain tumor diagnosis, bone stability prediction and osteoporosis, and imaging assessment of neuroinflammatory disorders such as multiple sclerosis. Dr. Weissmuller attended medical school in Munich with additional clinical training here at Yale. He received his MD degree from the Technical University of Munich in 1992, which included a scientific dissertation in neurology. In addition, he received a master's of science degree in physics from Munich, which included a master's thesis in machine learning. He completed his radiology residency and fellowship in diagnostic radiology in the Munich Medical Center, where he founded and directed an interdisciplinary research laboratory on AI and radiology. In 2006, he received a PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering at the Technical University of Munich for a PhD thesis on novel machine learning algorithms invented by him. He is the author of over 200 peer reviewed scientific publications, holds US and European medical licenses, US and German board certifications in diagnostic radiology, and a state doctorate and adjunct professorship at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Weissmuller. Thank you so much, Anna. I, I don't know what to say. I feel flattered about all these. <laughs> I was just paraphrasing. It was a very, very tiny bit of detail from all of your accomplishments. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Anna, for introducing me. Um, let me start with a, with a story. So when I was a little boy, uh, I wanted to know how the brain works. And so I um, asked my parents, uh, but they couldn't tell me. And I asked my my peers and friends and uh, teachers, but they couldn't tell me either. And this went on and on until I was a young, ambitious uh, student of, uh, college student of physics, and uh, a classmate of mine gave me a, a scientific American German edition uh, that had an article inside about a, a group of uh, strange scientists who tried to create software that would imitate um, to a certain extent what was thought at the time to be uh, representing functional principles of the brain. And um, that was the first time I encountered the term neural networks. And I was immediately electrified. And it was clear to me that this is the future and I want to be a part of it. And um, well, I cannot move the slides. Check. Does that work? No. Okay, there it goes. Um, and so, uh, my message is the following brain research and machine learning inspire each other. So brain research and machine learning inspire each other and let us use both to help our patients. 
So neural networks are the driving force of contemporary artificial intelligence. So 99% of industrial applications are based on neural networks in that domain, which leads me to my first reverie question, who organized the world's first ever scientific convention on neural networks in medicine? And I will give you the answer right away. It was this guy here. Um, who even looks younger on that old photograph than uh, he looks today. That was back in 1995. <laughs> and this was the world's first ever conference on uh, neural networks in biomedicine and took place in Lindau at Lake Constance between Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And um, I would like to uh, draw your attention to this tall gentleman here. He was actually very helpful because uh, he, was a Nobel Prize laureate. And he received the Nobel Prize a couple of years earlier for inventing the patch, cam, uh, patch clamp technique, which is a method to measure small currents through single ion channels in uh, neuron membranes. And he felt our enthusiasm with this. And so he uh, agreed to be uh, an invited speaker at our little conference. And that was made it easier to get all these uh, other invited speakers here, uh, which was the who, uh, who is who and, and, and the AI is scene of the 1990s. So th this, uh, of course, uh, gave me some self-confidence when I started a radiology residency in the mid 90s. Uh, I remember uh, meeting the radiology German at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. And I asked him, um, what is the, the, the secret of a successful career in radiology? And, but he wasn't so much interested in answering the question. But he asked me, Axel, what's going to be your research project? And uh, based on my experience in the field, I uh, looked into his eyes, right? And with a tone of conviction, I told him, I want to use neural networks to automatically read radiology studies. And of course, he looked at me as if I were from Mars, right? This was the uh, mid 1990s. And uh, I cannot blame him because, you know, this was way ahead of his time. And so uh, uh, this is the, the time when, you know, Axel was claiming AI is the next big thing in radiology. And as you can see in this, this is the curve of the general recognition and a reputation of uh, the field of AI in general, not just medicine, uh, over time over the last 70 years. And as you can see, this was possibly the worst possible way to a uh, time point to, to start a, a career in, in AI or neural networks uh, for several reasons. Um, and the uh, Underlying reasons is that in the 1990s, there was no further foreseeable improvement of neural network performance. Specifically, people were dissatisfied about a certain algorithm, specifically supervised learning with neural networks. And um, uh, there was distraction from other algorithms such as support vector machines. Uh, but as you all know, uh, this has changed completely, right? Uh, now, everybody believes that uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks are the best thing since the invention of sliced bread. Uh, people believe that, you know, they will replace doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. Um, and our own society, there's a photo from RSNA and the AI exhibition uh, taken a couple of years ago. Uh, so, so everybody is, is, is uh, kind of electrified now and um, uh, they even, uh, which are, <laughs> they sell uh, books now on neural networks for babies, right? Uh, teach babies and toddlers about artificial intelligence in the brain. So uh, I have um, actually a two and a half year old and a, and a six month old son, and both, uh, you know, uh, well, they don't enjoy that yet, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see that. So the question is now, how did that change come about, right? What caused this, what we now call AI summer? And interestingly, it was neither any new machine learning algorithm or any new scientific insight. It was just that data was available through the internet. So we had big data and uh, computers got faster. So data and computer power alone made the good old algorithms from the 1970s and 80s, specifically multi-day perceptrons, uh, trained with error back, error back propagation and, and convolutional neural networks work better. 
And uh, the big bang in that domain was the ImageNet competition back in 2010. Uh, this was a computer science uh, project where a data set of more than 14 million uh, you know, generic images, uh, not radiology images, not medical images, but you know, just, just photographs were manually labeled by a crowdsourcing approach for the presence or absence of uh, everyday object classes such as cats, dogs, cars, planes, and so forth. And the question was, uh, could we train a computer science or a computer vision algorithm to detect that what you see here is a cat? Uh, regardless whether the cat is, is small or big, or uh, you just see a, a, a part of the cat, you see a cartoon cat or a cat in a saucer. So the algorithm should tell you this is a cat. And this type of problem was tackled on a uh, regular basis based on an annual neural network conference, which is called NeurIPS. And as you can see, the, this uh, graph on the left shows you the error rate of that data set uh, that the best computer vision algorithm, uh, algorithm could accomplish. And there was a big leap in performance between 2011 and 2012, where the error rate went down from 25% to 15%, which is significant. And this success was, uh, so the winner entry was a convolutional neural network. And this success inspired uh, uh, a whole community to move and to rediscover uh, these good old algorithms again and uh, continue developing them. And as you can see, uh, the error rate went down in the years from 2011 to 2016. And the corresponding interest as measured by people using certain uh, uh, toolkits uh, for deep learning uh, exploded in that time uh, almost exponentially. And all these big companies got on board and, and uh, in our own domain in radiology, there is now this big ecosystem of smaller companies. Some are not so small anymore and uh, they try to make a, a fortune in this. So in the following, I want to tell you my own story over the last, yeah, well, 25 years of neural, uh, neural network research in, in, in radiology. Uh, we worked in different domains like classic computer-aided diagnosis, uh, complex system analysis, specifically image time series analysis, as well as uh, we also developed novel methods for machine learning, specifically on explainable AI. Let me get back to the slide uh, that there was um, some dissatisfaction about supervised learning with neural networks. Um, specifically, uh, how can these me methods generalize? How do they perform on small data? Uh, there was, as always, a limited availability of labeled data because labeled data is expensive. And uh, there was a lack of explanatory power. Um, so now comes my question, right? Uh, does that sound somehow familiar? And I strongly believe that we uh, live through a deja vu of this in the 2020s. And uh, as, I, as I would say, have grown up in this early phase of dissatisfaction with supervised learning, most of my own research work has been on approaches that are now being rediscovered under new buzzwords such as explainable AI, namely unsupervised, semi-supervised, and hybrid machine learning approaches. Um, so just for the non-machine learning uh, uh, people in this audience, um, uh, some technical terms. Supervised learning means learning with a teacher. So you have a desired result that is defined by a human. So you want uh, to train a neural network based on pairs of data X and Y, and you want to predict Y from X. For example, you have an image and you find a tumor on the image. You want the neural network to predict or, or locate that tumor. Um, so for that type of task, uh, you just need data. You need labeled data, but there is no human insight required. So an example for this is deep learning with, computational, uh, with, with a convolutional neural networks. On the other end of the spectrum, you have unsupervised learning, which means you don't have a human being with uh, domain knowledge that so this is learning without a teacher. So the goal is there just to transform data uh, without using any desired result. Why? And to further analyze that process data 
So in unsupervised learning, there's always a human machine interoperability step. So the algorithm transforms the data in a form that is more intuitively intelligible to humans. And then uh, humans pick up the data and try to infer some conclusions out of that transformed data. Classic examples are clustering, vector quantization, and dimensionality reduction. Uh, when I talk about a feature, I mean a mathematical property of objects in an image. Um, and these features may be handcrafted, uh, or uh, handcrafted means using some domain knowledge or machine crafted. So a, a typical example of handcrafted features is our everyday bread and butter radiology approach, right? Where we teach our residents, okay, this lung nodule is lobulated, this is spicculated, this has a connection to the pleura. And based on these uh, features, uh, we uh, want to come to a conclusion of how to classify this model with regards to being not benign, malignant, or being a certain type of, of tumor. So this is the feature-based approach. So how does supervised neural network learning uh, work? So just in a nutshell, so you, you have some images, you feed them in these speed forward networks, and you have a desired classification result, which means, uh, for example, you want to segment a brain tumor. Um, and so you get a lot of training data, you feed it in this network, and you can have more sophisticated um, uh, architectures like this old work from 2018 from my own group. And uh, then you can uh, figure out, okay, how well does this uh, method perform? You can use it for segmentation. So this kind of so-called end-to-end learning, right, where you have just um, uh, the, the, the image and the desired output and nothing else. This does not require, once the training data set is available, it does not require any uh, human domain knowledge input. Uh, on the other hand, you can um, use the more old fashioned methods, which are feature based. So uh, you use handcrafted features and this approach has been kind of rediscovered and now in the new buzzword, which is called radiomics. So for example, this is a little example. We wanted to classify between uh, glioblastomas or gliomas uh, from tumors that are um, metastases from uh, primary tumors outside the brain. And this is clinically important because the therapy is, is completely different. So you would like to uh, make this diagnosis out of an MR uh, with the, and, and, and the challenges that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard for the radiologist to classify between these two entities. Uh, but it would be important because you would like to avoid uh, dangerous uh, brain biopsies with a high mortality uh, and morbidity. And uh, so, uh, this is how it works. I, I just want to skip over all these technicalities. Uh, you know, this was a small homegrown data set to only 53 patients uh, that we collected um, uh, with some of them having uh, brain tumors as metastases and others as gliomas. And now we wanted to classify between the two. And um, to make a long story short, we, we extracted 630 uh, mathematical radiomics descriptors, feed them into some neural network and then, uh, of course, we did, uh, the usual stuff like tenfold cross validation and things like this. And uh, we, we calculate the area under the ROC curve to figure out how well that's that perform. As you can see, you know, the, the uh, results are, are at least encouraging. We get uh, areas somewhere between 0 0.75 and 0 0.85 uh, based on the combination of MR sequences that we use for this task. Uh, so this was the different types of handcrafted as well as fully automatic end-to-end -end supervised learning for radiology tasks. But how could we use um, unsupervised learning, right? Um, and this uh, leads me back to the, the beginning, to the late 90s of uh, beginning of my career, where we uh, used multispectral MRI data with the task that we wanted to get an automatic segmentation of the brain uh, with regards to gray matter, white matter, and cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, a lot of uh, neurologists and psychiatrists uh, likes that kind of quantitative data on these different tissue types for uh, all kinds of clinical applications and diagnosis and therapy monitoring. And uh, 
so if you just on, on the left hand side you see a t1 weighted image but, but you could also acquire uh, some inversion recovery sequence some flare sequence some uh, t2 weighted images and uh, then for each pixel of voxel in the brain you do not only get one single intensity one value but you get a high dimensional vector for each uh, of these uh, pixels or voxels and then you want to classify this but you can also use unsupervised learning uh, for example you can use uh, some uh, clustering method like this one where, where we worked a lot on because it has very nice uh, theoretical relations to statistical mechanics and physics. Um, uh, and, and this algorithm gives you um, a hierarchical uh, classification. Okay, video doesn't work anymore. So it gives you a, um, a tessellation of the feature space on different um, resolutions. And if you feed in now uh, these high dimensional MRI data, what you get are these cluster assignment images. And here are three examples. And for a radiologist, it's a piece of cake to figure out that the left one probably has pixels that belong to gray matter, the uh, middle one white matter and the white one cerebrospinal fluid. And now if you have, uh, for example, 20 clusters of that type, uh, and you have a radiologist's input about how to classify these cluster images, which takes you a few seconds, then uh, you collect all the corresponding clusters and come up with a segmentation which works quite well. Um, we even went further and developed uh, methods that had some semi-supervised approach. Um, for example, just to, to illustrate this a little bit, if you had a perfect segmentation of the left wing of that butterfly uh, with regions uh, that are black and others are yellow, and you would have a nonlinear mapping that would give you certain reference points on the right wing of the butterfly, you could uh, come up with a very good segmentation by utilizing the image that you have already learned on the left wing. Um, to do that same segmentation task on the right. And in order to do this, we developed an unsupervised adaptive vector quantization approach, which is uh, kind of uh, the inversion of a uh, classic neural network unsupervised learning algorithm, which is called the self-organizing map. And uh, we uh, published uh, papers in, in leading edge uh, computer science journals back in 2002 and 2004. What is remarkable in retrospect is that this was uh, basically a glimpse into the future from that time because um, this type of learning was um, rediscovered in computer science about 10 years later with this new term which is called uh, transfer learning. Right? You want to utilize what you have already learned uh, and uh, don't want to reinvent the wheel and retrain everything from scratch. Um, so uh, this is how it uh, works. So we have this nonlinear deformation in the high dimensional feature space of these multispectral MR data, which gave us a displacement field between a training uh, data set of one brain and a test data set of another brain. So you could use it in such a way if you have a reference segmentation that is either manual or uh, done by some supervised neural network of an individual Y, and now you get a new patient and you want to come up with a segmentation as well, you can use this algorithm and get a pretty good result without any further uh, human intervention. So in the, in the following years we went on, this is an example of multispectral MRI data with a clinical application in multiple sclerosis, uh, right? You had uh, seven different acquisitions. Uh, this was a project that we did with the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich. And uh, so what, the, what is the clinical idea? The clinical idea is you um, image the patient and uh, we develop a system that automatically delineates white metal lesions, right? And uh, based on the information that we get, we can uh, quantitatively figure out what's the volume, what's the uh, spatial distribution of these white metal lesions. Then you uh, treat the patient with some medication. Then you repeat after a couple of weeks and you do the same thing. And this gives you a good quantitative biomarker whether the therapy actually has worked or not. 
And uh, actually, there were many studies uh, based on our system. This is just one example from 2006 um, uh, at this Max Planck Institute for multiple sclerosis with some IV methyl prednisolone therapy. In the following years, we did a lot of uh, supervised, unsupervised, and hybrid machine learning approaches in different radiology application domains, such as interstitial lung diseases, breast cancer diagnosis, and bone structure in osteoporosis. This is the breast cancer example, right? Um, so the goal is you have suspicious lesions in the breast that you see on, on normal mammograms or in MR mammography. And the question now is, okay, is this a benign lesion? Uh, do I have to biopsy? Can I just wait? Uh, do I have to do a lumpectomy, uh, or is it a you know malignant lesion? And, and um, of course you can biopsy everything, but it might have be uh, might be good you know to uh, canalize the patients in such a way to, to streamline that diagnosis that you don't biopsy everything. And uh, the, the the way it worked is you know you can use uh, these complicated um, uh, contrast spatial temporal uptake patterns and there are subtle differences they may be very difficult to see for the human eye uh, but uh, neural networks can distinguish between these two types of lesions and we published quite a lot on this specifically with very small lesions where the classic methods that have been described in terms of contrast agent uptake curves are not very reliable and we published uh, lots of papers, most of them in the pre-deep learning area, uh, era, and there were also um, uh, patterns that uh, came along the way. Uh, now, uh, predicting fracture risk in osteoporosis was a, was a different project. So uh, here the goal is, uh, as you know, if you're a healthy, healthy subject, your, your trabecular bones usually look like a dense sponge. But if you grow older, when you grow older and, 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 and uh, get osteoporosis, it looks more like a Swiss cheese. And this change in microarchitecture leads to increased bone fragility, which is the clinical issue with osteoporosis. And um, so we used mathematical methods and machine learning methods to predict the yield stress, so the, the, the force that is needed to break that bone uh, based on medical imaging. And um, uh, for that, we used some very sophisticated features. Uh, for example, the scaling index method that we originally adopted that was originally developed in, um, uh, in, in cosmology, namely to describe three-dimensional uh, distributions of galaxies in space in cosmologic models. And we had the idea that we could use these features to describe trabecular bone and to predict the stability of that bone in osteoporosis. And uh, this is how it works. This is just one example. So if you have these bone cube specimens, you can extract these features and color code the features here in these bone cubes. You can feed all that information into neural networks. And uh, use that high dimensional information to classify whether uh, this bone uh, is, uh, has a specific high fragility. You can even precisely predict the yield stress, so the force that is needed to break the bone. And we were able to demonstrate that this uh, actually works better than the current clinical standard in this domain, which is um, uh, bone mineral density measured with uh, the DEXA method. Um, another MSK application, uh, which uh, points a little bit into the future, is phase contrast uh, CT. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the radiology that we are doing uh, right now and in, in, in the contemporary world is based on absorption. Right? And, but there is also X-ray diffraction. And uh, if you use the diffraction, you can get an images with an amazing uh, spatial resolution and soft tissue contrast. So uh, unfortunately, uh, these techniques are not available for patient imaging for certain technical reasons. And therefore, uh, it's only restricted to specimen imaging in small animals. And uh, as you can see, there's an example here, uh, an example of, of cartilage specimens, right? And each of these black dots here is a single cell. A cartilage cell with a diameter of about 10 microns. And uh, now the question arises, okay, can you distinguish between different types of these specimens, namely being osteoarthritic versus LC? And um, uh, 
uh, yes, uh, you can is the answer. And how do you do it? Of course, with neural networks. And uh, so uh, this were the first publications in the literature on a computer aided diagnosis on these uh, kind of future oriented face contrast x ray techniques. And this was a collaboration project with a physicist in Munich. And she gave me that data. She built this uh, face contrast CT, which she operates in, in uh, the uh, European Synchrotron facility in Grenoble in France. And, uh, uh, from, from a machine learning perspective, it's interesting um, that uh, you, we analyzed that kind of data, both with feature-based methods as well as with uh, pure deep learning methods, end-to-end -end learning. And there the question arises, okay, what happens in the depth, in the deep layers of these neural networks? And uh, this leads to the, the idea of explainability. and. Uh, we developed methods along the way to visualize the features that are extracted in the deep layers of the neural networks to better understand what's happening in there and uh, also with the goal to uh, improve transfer learning on these uh, data sets and uh, we did this with uh, uh, homemade methods like uh, um, uh, this XOM method that I will mention in a few minutes but also you can use methods off the shelf like um, uh, stochastic neighbor embedding. If you are interested in this type of machine learning aspects, uh, I refer you to that paper. Another classic domain where a lot of groups have worked is uh, chest X-ray automated analysis. Um, here we used one of the largest publicly available annotated data sets uh, of my colleague Ron Summers at the NIH with more than 100,000 uh, annotated chest X-rays and they are annotated with 14 common thoracic pathology labels such as pleural effusions, uh, pneumonia or, or, or hernia or uh, cardiomegaly, things like this. And so uh, we trained a 34 layer ResNet and um, these are our results uh, in the ROC curves. And as you can see, uh, it works pretty well, right? So you can uh, have an area of 0 0.82 for detecting analectasis, or uh, pneumonia is a little bit worse, like 0 0.73. Pneumothorax is pretty high, 0 0.85. So you can use this to automatically analyze chest X-rays. And um, uh, of course, we uh, compared our results with uh, the, the, the our peers, and I would like to draw your attention to this middle column. Um, it was the group of Andrew Eng uh, in 2017. And uh, as you can see, their results are pretty on par with what we get. And some we are better, some uh, others they are better. And Andrew Eng, who is, is a very famous uh, computer science professor uh, at Stanford, uh, he didn't publish in the first place. So he instead posted on Twitter, should radiologists be worried about their jobs? Breaking news, we can now diagnose pneumonia from chest X-rays better than radiologists. Uh, my answer to Andrew is, uh, this here, so he should have looked at pneumonia, and we are a notch better with pneumonia than he is, right? But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, th I think that this led to a lot of discussions in, in, in the field, you know, how should you treat uh, results? Uh, can they go to proper peer review? Uh, how honest should you be about the implications of your research in the, in the clinical world? So a lot of interesting topics here. Okay, uh, second short domain is uh, complex system analysis, causality, image time series analysis, machine learning for brain imaging. So our goal here is to bridge the gap between fundamental research and clinical application. And we have some track record here. Uh, namely, we introduced machine learning into functional MRI analysis back in 1998. And um, in more recent years, I've been more interested in uh, introducing novel methods to analyzing brain connectivity based on inference of causality. So uh, functional MRI as, uh, you know, you're a radiologist, but uh, we'll explain nevertheless. So you, you acquire images of the brain in uh, the same slice position over time. So for each pixel of voxel, you do not only get one signal intensity, you get a whole time series, right? And now comes the big question. Can we understand, which is the question that leads back to my initial story, right? I want to understand how the brain works, right? If we look at these time series and 
if you figure out how these interact with each other, can you really understand how the brain works? Right? It's very ambitious, but you know, uh, at least could we use that kind of knowledge to figure out whether we can do something useful in clinical practice with this knowledge. Um, and uh, so our first approaches here were completely unsupervised learning. So we used some vector quantization approach with minimal free energy vector quantization. And uh, what you get here are cluster images as well as the corresponding time series. And this was a visual stimulation experiment. And as you can see, this unsupervised learning algorithm gets you clusters that really depict the visual cortex in this visual stimulation experiment. And it also gives you the corresponding time series, right? This was a boxcar stimulus uh, function, uh, which actually was not used in the analysis of this. But uh, these clusters just emerge from an unsupervised process um, of uh, the, this learning algorithm. Uh, but uh, uh, th this was a real success story because it was applicable to a wide range of uh, radiology applications. So in, in the vein of this, we came up with the first publication in the literature using neural networks for brain perfusion uh, at all. And uh, we published this in 2006, but it also is applicable to MR, mammography, and, and other domains as well. In more recent years, uh, as I mentioned, we are now working more on brain connectivity. So the, the, the key question is, if you look at all these time series in different regions of the brain, how do these regions talk to each other? Can we understand how that works? And for time series analysis methods, uh, there is a wish list in that regard. If you have you know, two time series in the brain from two different regions, you want to uh, figure out, okay, is one region a causal driver of the other region or not? So you want to have such methods being directed. They should um, be nonlinear. They should be multivariate. That means um, you just don't want to look at a pair of time series A and B. You want to see how does A influence B in the presence of thousands of other time series. And they should be large scale, which means uh, they should be computationally tracked. And cross-correlation is the mainstay of functional MRI analysis. So 99% of the literature in functional MRI using cross-correlation. And as you can see, they are neither non-linear, directed, multivariate, uh, all are negatives here. The only thing is can be uh, computed very fast. And we, uh, over the years, have developed all these algorithms denoted in orange here, namely mutual connectivity analysis and large-scale Granger causality, and the nonlinear version of this, um, that now get more pluses. And uh, our uh, last publication, uh, just a few weeks ago, has this algorithm that has uh, fulfills all these criteria. and. Um, so the, uh, this is one of the older algorithm, mutual connectivity analysis. And that one, uh, uh, this is just a few papers on this, uh, can be used to uh, diagnose uh, neurologic disease, but you can also use it um, to just identify um, certain uh, areas in the brain for pre-surgical planning. For example, uh, there's an example of the motor cortex that we reconstruct only from resting state functional MRI data. So we just check the connectivity between different re brain regions. And using this algorithm, MCA, in uh, combination with the community detection algorithm and non-metric clustering, uh, we are able to reconstruct these uh, brain areas. Um, Another algorithm, uh, as I mentioned, large-scale Granger causality is inspired by the work of a Nobel Prize laureate in um, uh, economics from the 1970s, um, Clive Granger. And uh, we uh, further developed this method uh, to be usable for functional MRI analysis. Uh, and uh, for reasons of time, of course, I cannot go through the math. Uh, but if you're interested in there are some recent papers on, on how we do it. Um, instead, I would like to use the time to give you the clinical vision. So, so what's the clinical implication? So if you look at the brain and we have these different regions and they create these time series, now the question arises, how uh, do these regions talk to each other? So for example, uh, how does this blue time series influence this purple time series, right? And we use uh, 
one or more of our methods, like a large scale Granger causality, to define a quantity that tells us that nonlinear directed um, influence of one node in that graph to the other one. And the result is such a connectivity matrix, which is equivalent to such a graph. And of course, if you have many uh, brain regions, these graphs get quite complicated. Um, and now, what's the clinical point here, right? You can extract high dimensional feature vectors from that type of network. And you can do it in different ways. Either you can use graph theory to extract certain graph theoretical properties out of these networks, or you can just use this connectivity matrix, right, which is equivalent to the graph and concatenate all the rows or columns of this and get a high dimensional feature vector. Now you have different cohorts, like uh, let's say, uh, HIV related cognitive impairment patients and uh, healthy controls. And for each of these patients, you get one such feature vector. Now uh, it becomes clear what you're going to do. You feel it in a supervised uh, neural network uh, or other machine learning approach to classify whether this patient suffers from the disease or not. And uh, we have uh, published uh, many uh, papers recently, Journal of Neuroscience, Method, Neuroimage, and, and so forth. And we even went a step further. So uh, if you look at these um, patients with HIV-related cognitive impairment, so these are average connectivity matrices. And even with the uh, naked human eye, you know, you see that there may be some differences, but it's very hard for humans to, to analyze this. And um, what we figured out is that it does not end, uh, only allow us to classify between having the disease or not, but we can even go a step further. We can actually predict how well is an individual patient performing in a neuropsychological testing scenario, right? How well are they doing with executive overall attention, speed, motor learning tasks or memory? And we can do this from fMRI data only. And now this opens up, uh, you know, a new horizon of, of uh, streamlining diagnosis and, and getting um, uh, quantitative biomarkers for neurologic disease. Um, and uh, this is an example of uh, where we applied it to HIV-related uh, neurocognitive disorder. And uh, these are just a, a list of papers of the last two or three years um, uh, with uh, various clinical applications in different neurology domains. Uh, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, we published this paper in Nature Scientific reports about this large-scale nonlinear Granger causality uh, for inferring directed dependence. Uh, you know, as you can see in this title, there is no medical reference at all because we strongly believe that this can be used everywhere in, you know, complex system analysis in economics or, you know, other domains of, of, of life. Uh, for the clinical world, um, here is, is an example, right? Uh, this is a data set from uh, the Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange, ABIDE, um, on autism spectrum disorder. So there were about 24 ASD patients and, and 35 typical controls. And now if you use the clinical standard method, um, here, the y-axis is the performance of the method. It gives you the area under the ROC curve, right? And as you know, with uh, area under the ROC curve, 0 0.5 is like random guessing. So this is what the blue curve is what uh, the current clinical standard is with cross-correlation. And as you can see, it's not much better than randomly guess whether a patient has the disease or not. This is our results here. And uh, as you can see, there is not a need for a sophisticated statistical significance test to figure out which method performs better. So there are light years in between the clinical standard and uh, uh, what our methods can perform. And um, uh, as, uh, just as I mentioned, uh, of course, we are also investigating other uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, approaches to uh, neurologic disease. Um, management uh, with uh, graph convolutional neural networks. For example, this is a big data set with almost 1,000 uh, functional MRI data set from a big consortium on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where we were able to achieve results that outperform the best published uh, uh, results in the current literature. So um, 
from the machine learning perspective, it's interesting to also not only classify whether a patient has a disease or not, but we would like to learn something about the disease, right? We would like to know why is this patient classified as being uh, HIV-related cognitively impaired? And uh, for this reason, we uh, have developed methods that give us um, a hint on which regions or connections are primarily involved in that classification. Uh, for example, this list of brain regions that are involved in um, uh, distinguishing patients with uh, HIV cognitive impairment, yes or no. And we use this general matrix le learning vector quantization algorithm for this task, which we um, developed about 10 years ago. Um, and this gives us um, a, a, a hint about the relevance of each feature, namely uh, a certain brain region or a certain connection between brain regions um, to uh, whether it's important for the uh, diagnosis um, or uh, regression task in terms of predicting the clinical performance of a patient. So I strongly believe that this type of uh, research uh, will lead to a new exciting future in neurological and uh, psychiatric uh, disease diagnosis and therapy management. And uh, I'm uh, uh, happy that uh, our methods uh, work well and uh, we hope that we will have additional progress in the field, not just by our group, but maybe by others as well. And finally, um, just as a quick mention, we de developed novel methods for machine learning, specifically uh, unsupervised learning approaches. This is an example of uh, exploratory observation machine that uh, uh, I uh, just mentioned. This is an application in uh, whole uh, gene microarray data analysis uh, where we uh, project very high dimensional data onto two dimensional maps and the uh, biologists like to use these tools to better understand the function of uh, proteins that they don't know very well. And um, we also applied it in economics data as well as in for radiomics in, in, in radiology. And there were patterns along the way. Of course, there's a lot of math publications, which uh, for reasons of time, of course, I have to just switch to. Finally, uh, now we have all these nice algorithms. So the question arises, so all, what, what is the real usefulness in clinical practice? And so it's about the quality evaluation of AI. And uh, I start with uh, the famous statement by Keith Dreyer it says, okay, a radiologist with AI may be better than a radiologist without AI. But the question is, how can we actually measure this? And so uh, I strongly believe that we need to perform this evaluation with the same rigor as evaluating a new drug for patient use. So the proposed solution is uh, a new method that we developed um, with this catchy acronym, which calls Artificial Intelligence Perspective Randomized Observer Blinding Environment. And uh, this is how it works. I just will present you an example. Um, it's, we used it for intracranial hemorrhage detection with a um, a commercial application from ADOC, and we studied the turnaround time in a prospective randomized clinical trial. And so we, we collected several hundreds of CT scans, and uh, the, the, the key was that we blinded radiologists randomly uh, about the results, the reading results of this AI software. And our idea was that we can thus investigate whether AI has an impact on the radiology uh, study turnaround time, because we have two groups, right? Um, and uh, this is, you know, just a few examples. Uh, the software detects intracranial hemorrhage. As you can see, it works well in most cases, but, you know, it's also a lot of false positives like here. And um, so these are our results. So we found that the turnaround time uh, of studies that were not visible as uh, being positively read for uh, by AI um, uh, was, was significantly higher than the turnaround time um, uh, when the radiology uh, radiologist received 
uh, the information about the AI reading result. And uh, uh, this is kind of very challenging to set up this the IT infrastructure to do these prospective randomized clinical trials, but I strongly believe it's actually necessary because otherwise everyone can claim that AI is, is very good and for radiology, but we need quantitative data to really demonstrate that. And uh, once we had set this up, um, COVID-19 came around, right? And uh, so we used the same intracranial hemorrhage detection in our institution and tracked it over time. And what we did here is uh, uh, we, we tracked not only the total number of CT studies that we did, and, and you may have observed this at your institution as well, the blue curve shows you, shows you the total number. And it, it went down through the early pandemic outbreak, which was uh, March and April in 2020, and then gradually went up again. And uh, what's more interesting here is we tracked the ratio of positively detected intracranial hemorrhage cases. And what we found is, uh, interestingly, that those went up. Right. Although the number of um, uh, total studies decreased. So that gave us a first hint, okay, there might be some from embodied complications uh, uh, related to COVID-19. And that was the time when the first papers came out from uh, internal medicine as well as, as uh, pathology that found that uh, people were, uh, had a higher morbidity and more uh, mortality related to from embolic complications, specifically pulmonary embolism. So the success of this led us to the idea, okay, could we do something on pulmonary embolism? But the issue was that with a single institution, uh, you don't get enough data, right? You, you will not be able to, to show anything um, uh, reliable. And so uh, we decided to start a big consortium that uh, encompassed um, 13 institutions around the country, um, and, and the, the size of the, the, the dot here marks the number of cases they contributed. So it's from East Coast to West Coast. And the challenge was that we wanted to harvest data uh, in a, in a multi-institutional uh, setting. And this is really challenging because you need to be, have IRB approvals for each institution. And we managed to set up the technical infrastructure that we could do this data harvesting. And we did this, we did this in a way that repurposed the ADOC orchestration software. This is something that they also use for post-marketing surveillance. And uh, that is, uh, big accomplishment because it's not easy to extract such data from such heterogeneous IT environments. Uh, but we were actually successful. Now we use the ground truth, uh, which was different. It was not the AI read uh, of uh, PE. It was just natural language processing on a radiology report. And uh, to figure out how well this natural language processing approach works, uh, we did an, a, a, a uh, validation trial. So in the whole consortium with 13 um, participating institutions, we analyzed more than 40,000 uh, chest CT pulmonary angiograms. So a lot of data. And uh, we compared two time periods, namely prior to COVID-19, as you can see here on the left, and uh, after the early pandemic outbreak. So this was from November till February uh, uh, 2020, and this was uh, from March through May. And as you can see, the total number of CTPA scans in the whole uh, group went down, right? Here is Yale, you know, you are the green curve here and your numbers went down, but this happened to everyone. So that's not uh, really exciting. But what is exciting is the right side here. Namely, although the number of uh, exams went down, the ratio of the pulmonary embolism positive CTPA exams went up. And if you look at the numbers, you know, may first first think, okay, it's 9.9% and then it's 11.6%. But the numbers are so big, right, that this is 
highly statistically significant on the order with a p-value of less than 10 to the negative 4. So this is a really clear uh, sign that we have an uh, increased observed prevalence of pulmonary embolism uh, during the early COVID-19 phase. And this is the breakup uh, according to individual institutions. As you can see, this were the data from your institution at Yale, right? Uh, and, and uh, for, for, for your institution, it's, it's even more striking, right? You did uh, fewer exams, right? This is the total numbers here. You did fewer exams uh, from, it was 1,200, I, I cannot read this, 1,260 or something. And uh, it went down uh, by several hundreds. But in even those cases, if you look at the absolute numbers, your PE positive, the positivity rate went up. So this is pretty impressive. And so we have uh, now, um, uh, submitted this last week uh, in this big multi-center consortium and I'm very grateful uh, to um, uh, contributors uh, and authors uh, here in, in, in your group at Yale, uh, specifically Chris Ganji, uh, Isabel Kotopasi and, and uh, Anna Beda, who I'm still grateful, uh, who took the role as the communicating uh, author of uh, this big endeavor. So let's keep our fingers crossed. It is not peer reviewed yet, but we are hopeful that uh, this can be published soon. So this was a quick uh, overview of uh, my own story of AI. So now where is the future? Everybody knows by now that you can download publicly available data from the web. You can download uh, neural network code from GitHub and you can perform your supervised learning and publish. So uh, high school students can do this. So what's the point, right? Nevertheless, there have been big promises in the field, right? Uh, but we still do not see the automatic radiologist that was predicted by a famous computer science uh, professor Geoffrey Hinton in 2021, uh, nor do we any noticeable help uh, of AI in our clinical practice. Let alone, I cannot even go from uh, Rochester to, to uh, Yale with my self-driving autonomous car. You know, I just have to drive it myself. So I see a lot of label cosmetics where people selling um, uh, sophisticated uh, driver assistance systems as autonomous cars, but they actually are, no, uh, are none. So my question is, how could it happen that we in the general public were brainwashed to believe that we can actually save the world by convolutional neural networks? And this is strangely similar to what I started my talk with about this, this illusionment of neural networks in the mid 90s. And what's fascinating, it's even the same algorithm, namely supervised learning with feedforward multi-layer perceptrons and convolutional neural networks with error back propagation. So we are living through this déjà vu in the machine learning field right now. So from a machine learning perspective, we need to refocus on so far neglected domains of uh, machine learning, uh, explainable AI, specifically using unsupervised, semi-supervised, weekly supervised learning, inference of causality, relevance learning, uh, reinforcement learning is another uh, very important point. Um, we need to make decision processes transparent to human insight and forcing machines to provide us with information that is intuitively intelligible by, to us as radiologists. And why? Well, until we actually know and can rebuild a artificial general intelligence, which is something for the 22nd century, um, we need intelligent machines that we can interact with in a meaningful way. So I believe that human machine interoperability is key for the foreseeable future. And we need to actually revalue our own human domain knowledge as radiologists, including these crafted features, which can also be machine crafted. And as an example, I uh, mentioned our own work in brain connectivity and causality. So in a nutshell, I strongly believe that AI will empower radiologists to be better and faster, at least that is the big goal. Uh, it will not replace radiologists, at least in the near future, although maybe in the far future, there might be some, uh, uh, some parts being taken over by machines, which is good at some point. 
uh, I told you a little bit about my own contributions in the field on mammography, uh, CAT, interstitial lung disease, bone stability and osteoporosis, brain perfusion MRI, uh, brain tumor classification, and functional MRI for diagnosing neurologic disease and automatic reading of chest radiographs. Uh, so I believe that AI will significantly change all clinical, educational, and administrative activities in radiologists. And um, it has an tremendous integrated, interdisciplinary, and, and inspirational power to lead radiology to the next level. Specifically, for those uh, of you in the audience who are young faculty, residents, or fellows, this is a, a great domain to, uh, to, to put your career on in the years to come. Um, so, this leads me back to my original message that brain research and machine learning inspire each other. And let us use both to help our patients. Uh, let me thank my research team, uh, both at the University of Rochester, as well as my group at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. And uh, there is an international networks of uh, collaborators, as well as mentors, and some companies that have helped me to build up my group. I also want to specifically thank my wife and my family and this is the newest uh, member in our research team he looks very excited uh, for me uh, the reason is that i um, uh, gave him as a present this little book on neural networks for babies and so he's really excited about this uh, so thank you for your attention uh, if you want to know more just uh, send me an email and uh, uh, if there is anyone interested in working with my group uh, you know we are always hiring uh, thank you so much for your attention I cannot hear the big applause from the Olympic Stadium. Are there any questions right now? Or should we access the chat? Yes, I think we can. G2 is helping us chat. But, uh, if, uh, okay, to recall now. Rob Goodman says, good talk. Okay. What are your thoughts on the concept of bias? in AI arising from the types of data sets used. Sure, that's an important issue that we need to take care of. Um, there is no golden rule to this and no golden way that is generally accepted. Of course, you have to be cognizant of this in, in all you do because, uh, of course, uh, as both scientists and radiologists, we have to be cognizant of, uh, you know, the, at the center of what we do is the human being. There are these um, this unfavorable side effects that certain patient groups are discriminated based on, on this feature-based learning. That's, that's kind of uh, challenging. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, yeah, thanks for this question. This is really interesting because you have to understand why are certain patients classified as being in one group or the other, right? And if it turns out that this is related to sex, religion, or uh, you know, origin, uh, that's kind of bad. But if you just have your neural network, which is this celebrated end-to-end -end learning that everybody's crazy about saying, oh, I don't need domain knowledge, I just need data and I need the neural network, uh, you will miss out on this, right? And, and therefore, I strongly believe the machines need to communicate with us in a way that uh, we have intuitively intelligible ideas on why the AI comes up with a certain uh, conclusion. Uh, otherwise, uh, I completely agree we will, we will uh, get into trouble with uh, regards to um, uh, you know, diversity and, and discrimination in patients. But there are other questions. Uh, are the radiology AI techniques already adopted in radiation oncology treatment planning? what's the most common application of biggest um, potential? Uh, sure, I uh, believe that radiation oncology planning can uh, uh, extremely profit from this, but there are also lower level tasks in, in radiation oncology, specifically segmentation, right? A lot of people have been working on segmentation for these planning cities in, in um, uh, radiation oncology. Uh, so th there's a, a great future for this. Um, then I have another, maybe can someone um, read the questions to me because I have still trouble seeing the, the, the 
So my question is, what infrastructure do you believe a department needs to implement effective AI research and collaboration with biomedical engineering? Um, well, you need <laughs> people who can bridge the gap uh, between the two worlds, right? But this is, that, that's the point. You need to have people who are both radiologists and machine learning scientists. I, I think there are a lot of um, uh, you know prospective radiology residents nowadays. You know who have some computer science background. And, uh, I'm I'm kind of uh, you know I, I'm one of these, but you know I have been in the business uh, long, and, and I, my path to this was. I'm a completely trained physicist and I'm also a completely trained radiologist. And nowadays you find people as, you know, neural networks are taught to babies now. Uh, once they grow up, they should be able to contribute also the machine learning knowledge to, to radiology. So, uh, but uh, yeah, communication is important. Uh, also, we need to um, really utilize the resources that we have, right? Uh, specifically communication and collaboration with startup companies, which actually uh, turns out uh, to, to take a significant amount of my time right now to, to figure out, okay, how can we help them better understand what we need and vice versa, uh, how can, can they get their products into the real world? Uh, this is an important task. So uh, to, to answer that question, shortly we need communication and mutual understanding to bridge the gap between fundamental research and clinical application. Is that another question? How do you recommend to practically translate novel algorithms into clinical practice? Maybe you can re-invite me again and I can <laughs> talk about this in, uh, in detail. Uh, yes, so, so this is, um, uh, you know, we did the first eight steps. So I, I can just have two short sort of thoughts. Uh, one is this randomized prospective clinical trial where we use the same diligence as checking out a new drug, right? Uh, you just don't rely on any marketing uh, messages saying, oh, we are doing great stuff. You really want to know it quantitatively. And uh, we have to actually reinvent clinical testing in a way that we do not test drugs on patients, but we test AI on radiologists, right? And, and uh, this is kind of a strange way to move things forward, but I believe that this is the way to go. Uh, we have to, as we tried in this AI talk approach, we have to quantitatively figure out and, and really get hard numbers. Does it really make us better and faster? Uh, another side aspect is, of course, we could, for example, utilize um, the existing software and for example, that we used in this multi-center project, not just for post-market surveillance, but to completely re revolutionize um, uh, QA radiology, right? Because uh, you, uh, currently in our peer review process, we get randomly presented cases and we make friends with our peers by criticizing their radiology reports. And this is not very effective, neither is it efficient. And if we have now some AI in the background that uh, always compares with natural language processing, what was actually said by the radiologist and what was found by the AI image analysis and only gives us the discordant cases, uh, we are uh, by orders of magnitude better and uh, can completely redefine QA in radiology. So this is a big dream, right? This is kind of, I'm seeing Chris already uh, here uh, getting excited, which is, uh, which is great. Okay. One last question there. Thinking about applying image deformation for registering multiple images on a patient with multiple scans performed over time. How quickly can these AI driven image registration algorithms perform on a single patient with multiple scans? Yes, this is a great, um, Great question. It is um, actually it's the key. I, I strongly believe that a lot of these companies, if not all, completely miss out on the temporal aspect of what we do in radiology. Right, eighty percent of our patients are not coming in for the first time. They they are just follow up exams. You know, cancer follow up exams. Right. And so you have this 10 exams uh, coming up in the packs. And now the question is, oh, it's so tedious to manually match up all these images and match up the nodules and 
count the nodules and figure out is there a new nodule? And uh, I'm asking myself, right? I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist myself, right? And I feel it feel your pain, right? Because it's my pain, and and I want this to change. And the basis for this is uh, in this question, the brilliant question, namely, uh, the basis for all this is co-registration of the old study and the new study, but not just in the dumb way as we have the PEX alignment, right, that just uses the table position, but content-based image registration, where you really say, okay, this is the nodule, and then the machine should automatically tell you, uh, yeah, this nodule has grown by 30% uh, and compared to whatever, 2016, and uh, so, so, I don't know why we are still working like in the middle ages, right? And, and I would really like to see, and I completely agree that um, the, the, the holy grail is either, uh, either solve the image segmentation problem or the registration problem perfectly, then you would be done in medical image processing. These two problems are kind of complementary to each other, and there are still you know, no um, uh, perfect methods. But with, if we put everything together, what we know about machine learning and uh, put our clinical knowledge in, we should get something that is way better than the current clinical standard of the industry products that we have right now. And so that would be a big goal, right? And uh, I will be happy to work with, with you and with uh, you know, everyone else who wants to drive the field of radiology further in that regard. Oh, I haven't told you the story, the, 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 the second, well, short, 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 of, the, of a story with the radiology chairman from Munich. So about 20 years later, it was RSNA 2016 or 17 at the high time of, of, of the AI hype, right? Um, I ran again into this radiology chairman. He's now retired, but he's still active. And uh, we met at the hallway between two overcrowded, overpacked AI sessions and uh, the RSNA. And um, so I, I couldn't withstand the temptation asking him, so neural networks in radiology, so guess who was right? Mm -hmm. And then he said something, like, well, okay, for some technologies, it takes uh, you know, many years until they mature and they can be used. And uh, that is right, but I strongly believe it takes more than just that. It takes people who swim against the stream, right? They, they, they uh, have an idea and stick to the idea and work hard and keep going. And uh, this is what as I would recommend to all the young faculty and fellows and residents here in this audience, right? Uh, don't care about what others say, right? And then just keep going and work hard. And, and that is the, the secret of a successful career. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy this. And uh, yeah, um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to reach out by email. I think it was on the last slide and we have a recording on this. So uh, yes, I will be happy to discuss all these uh, fundamental questions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.